You know, it's been said that unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. And it may not be that we mean to be ingrateful or ungrateful whenever we don't express our thanks, but it can be perceived as ingratitude if we fail to say thank you. And one of the things that I've been trying to do in this last month as I've made the announcement of God's call on my life uh, to First Baptist Church of Blairsville, Georgia, is to say thank you. And I know that my words are inadequate, but I owe you a a debt of gratitude that I'll never be able to repay. Uh, I feel like I got the better end of this deal when God called me here in 1994. You guys have been more than a church to me. You are my family. And I will never forget that. And I don't care where I go, I will always love you. And I will be who I am in great part because of you. And so I want to say thank you. And I'm not the only pastor who's done this. You know, in this month, we've been looking at some of the writings of the Apostle Paul concerning his call to salvation and his call to ministry. But also, we've been looking at his words of gratitude and his words of prayer. And so what I want to do today is take you to the New Testament book of Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. And today, I just want to talk about a message I'm calling grateful and prayerful, because that's how I feel. I'm grateful, but I'm also prayerful. I'm grateful for you, and I'm prayerful for you. Here in Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 3 and following, we see Paul writing a letter to the church of the city of Philippi. Um, if you hear the name Philippi, it, it probably reminds you of a person's name, doesn't it? Uh, Philip. Uh, actually, Philippi, even in Paul's day, was an ancient city. Uh, it was a city founded by Philip of Macedon. You probably know his son a little better from history, uh, Alexander the Great. But Philip of Macedon established this city centuries earlier, and it had become a major player on the world scene in the first century. And on his second missionary journey, God sent Paul to Philippi, uh, this Roman colony that had primarily a Gentile community, but still some Jews there. And God used Paul to preach the gospel, to lead some people to salvation, and to form a church. Uh, later, he was run out of town, as often was the case, when people didn't like him or the gospel that he preached. So now about 10 years has passed since he founded this city, founded it, or this church, probably founded it in around AD 51 of the first uh, century, and he's writing this letter somewhere in the early 60s of the first century. And here he's expressing his gratitude and he's verbalizing his prayer for the Philippian Christians. And so what I'd like to do is just make a couple of comments today as we walk through these verses together. Uh, the first thing I would like to say for you is that I am thanking God for past grace. That's what Paul does, and that's what I want to do today. I want to thank God for past grace, God's unmerited love, his, his blessings, his favor that he bestows upon us in Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. Paul begins uh, by addressing the bishops, that's the leaders of the church, and the deacons, by the way. Uh, he, he addresses them in verses 1 and 2. And then in verse 3, he writes this, I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you. Let's just pause there at verse 3. He, Paul says, I am thanking God every time I remember you. And that's an amazing thing, by the way, that Paul remembers the Philippian Christians and how he was used by Jesus to reach them with the gospel and to found that church because it was not an easy time in Paul's life. And yet when he thought back, he didn't focus on all the pain and the suffering and the hardships that he endured. No, he focused on the people and how grateful he was to God for them. He says, every time I remember you, I give God thanks. This is not a one-time gratitude. It is an ongoing gratitude of my life, Paul writes. And who are the people that he is remembering? Well, among the people in the city of Philippi that he reached with the gospel was a woman named Lydia. Lydia was a businesswoman. Uh, she was a Gentile who had been attracted to the God of Israel and had become a God-fearer. And so she was hanging out with the Jews, learning more about Yahweh. 
And when Paul and Timothy and Silas and Luke entered the city, one of the things that they did is they saw that there was no synagogue. You had to have at least 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue. And for whatever reason, there was no synagogue in Philippi, but there were Jews. And typically, Paul went to the Jews first. Remember Romans chapter 1, verse 16? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Gentile. So he would go and find out the Jewish people, teach them the Jewish scriptures, and help them make the connection that Jesus is the Messiah that we've been looking for. And he died, was buried, he rose from the dead, and he'll save you and bring you into God's kingdom if you will trust him. Well, being no synagogue was available, he found that there was a group of women who would meet at a riverside for prayer. And so they just went down there. And one of the women was Lydia. And the Bible says that the Lord opened her heart to hear what Paul had to say. By the way, I love that. If you're a preacher of God's word, you need to be reminded your job is to faithfully proclaim the word of God, but only Jesus can open hearts. We have to leave the results to him. And if anyone gets saved, it is not because you saved them. It is because Jesus Christ saved them and opened their hearts and changed their lives. And so we have Lydia uh, there as one of the early converts of Paul in Philippi. Later, as they continue through the city of Philippi preaching, they attract the attention of a young slave girl whose masters would put her out on the public streets to be a fortune teller. And the Bible says that she was actually possessed with a demonic possession. That's where her knowledge to be a fortune teller came from. And it was a weird thing. She would follow Paul and Luke and Timothy and Silas all around the city, and she would, she would yell out to anyone who would listen, these men are from God, and they're preaching the way of salvation. You say, hey, that's a good thing. But she got on Paul's nerves. You know, sometimes people can be saying the right things, but it's drawing attention to themselves rather than the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're causing more of a disruption. And so Paul eventually turned and stopped her, and he cast out the demon and set her free from that demonic possession. She was saved and gloriously changed, just like Lydia's life was changed. And then, because the owner of that slave girl is now losing money because she's no longer demon-possessed and able to be a fortune teller and rake in the, the dough, they cause a riot against these missionaries to the city. And they create a riot from the citizens, and eventually Paul and his companions are arrested, and they are beaten with rods. And they're thrown in jail. And there they are, suffering for Jesus. And yet, what do they do while they're in jail? Do they sing the blues? No, they sing praise to God. And while they're singing praises to God, God hears their prayers and sends an earthquake that shakes the jail bars open, breaks the shackles from their feet, and they are now free. Not just Paul and, and his companions, but every person in the jail can now escape. And the jailer is afraid that he has lost control of the prison and he has lost his prisoners and he is about to fall on his own sword. And then Paul cries out, don't do any harm to yourself. We are still here. We haven't left. And he runs in and he sees Paul and his companions and he's heard them praising Jesus. And the first thing the Philippian jailer asks is, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they say, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you could be saved, you and your household. And this Philippian jailer, just like Lydia, gets saved, gets baptized, changes his life. And so when Paul thinks about the city of Philippi and he thinks about the church, he's got particular people in mind. He's got people like Euodius and Syntyche, two other women who were prominent workers and fellow helpers with him in the church at Philippi. And he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. In Fort Caroline Baptist Church, you are not a location, 11428 McCormick Road, and you're not a web address, and you're not a live stream. To me, you are people with names, with faces, with stories, and I've seen God at work in your life, and I rejoice in that every time I think about you. And Paul writes in verse 4, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. 
Paul says, I think about you and I pray for you always. And with every prayer, I pray with joy. You say, joy? If you think back to what you endured, being physically beaten and persecuted and falsely imprisoned and maligned and you had to flee the city, what is there to be joyful about? But Paul recognized joy is different from happiness. Happiness is based on what happens to you, happenstance. If your circumstances are favorable, then you can be happy. If your circumstances are bad, you can't be happy. I don't want happiness. I want joy that no matter what's going on in my life, I know that God is with me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. He makes all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose and that he is at work even when I can't see it. And I can have joy that something good can come out of even this painful time of my life. And that's why Paul had joy. He looked beyond the pain and saw the fruit of his labors and the fruit of the gospel because he had reached them with the gospel and now they had partnered with him in the gospel ministry of reaching others. That's what the word partnership means. In the Greek language, uh, it's koinonia. We sometimes uh, translate it fellowship. And we think fellowship is when we get together and eat. Uh, We Baptists even have a place we call the fellowship hall that's attached to a kitchen because we so associate fellowship with food. And that can be a part of fellowship, but the Greek word literally meant people who come together in business. Uh, it, 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 It was a word used in Greek language to speak of business partners who would share the risk of their new business and the responsibilities of their business. And if everything goes well, we will share in the rewards of our business together. We're partners. It was also a word in the Greek language used of marriage, that we become partners when we become man and woman. And so Paul baptizes this word koinonia, and he says, you have become partners with me in the gospel from the first day until now that we have joined hands and we've joined hearts in reaching other people with the gospel. And how the Philippians did that was through their own prayers for Paul, through keeping up with him over the previous 10 years, and by often sending him money whenever he was in prison. Uh, It's a common joke uh, that whenever Paul would go to a city, the first thing he would say is, show me the jail. That's probably where I'm going to spend the night. Um, And when the Philippians would hear about the hardships of Paul, even though they were not a wealthy, large church, they would take up money and give it to Paul and his companions to help him with his ministry. And I want to thank you for your partnership in the gospel of Jesus Christ since the first day that you called me here so many years ago. Every good thing that's happened is because of the grace of God, all for the glory of God, but he has used you as partners in the gospel work here at Fort Caroline. So one of the reasons that Fort Caroline is so well respected is because people know about the heart of this church for the Lord and the heart of this church for this community and the heart of this church for reaching other people here in Jacksonville, but also all over the world. And I tell them, listen, it's not just a preacher who preaches on Sunday morning. It's all of us working together, all of us doing our part. So thank you, church, for your praying, for your giving, for your sacrificing, for your encouraging, for worshiping, for inviting others, for trusting your pastors who led you all these years. Thank you for loving us and making it easy, not hard, to lead this church. He writes in verse six, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm very confident that he who began a good work in you. You say, is Paul referring to himself? Absolutely not. Paul recognizes that the good work in the Philippian Christians, the good work of salvation is all because of Jesus. And the he in verse six is Jesus. And I'm sure of this, that he, Jesus, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That ours is not only the gospel of a good beginning, it is the gospel of a good ending. And Paul says, I know you may go through hardships before Jesus comes back. I may go through hardships. Actually, when Paul's writing this letter, he's in prison again. 
<laughs> he's in jail again, not because he's done anything wrong, but he's done everything right, and he's suffering for the cause of Christ. And he says, but I'm not worried in the least. I know that God who started this in your life is going to finish this in your life because it's all by God's grace. You are saved by God's grace. You are sustained by God's grace. You are sanctified by God's grace. And one day by God's grace, you will be together with me in heaven at the throne of Jesus. Every time I read Philippians 1 verse 6, I think of that old hymn of the faith um, written I can't remember if it was in the late 1800s, probably. Um, but I resonate with the words of the song. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he has made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. There's a lot I don't know, but this I do know. Jesus is a good savior. And what he begins, he finishes. And Paul says, the same is true of you. And I can be confident that even if I'm not with you in Philippi, even if I don't ever get back there to see you face to face, I'm confident that God will continue his work in you and he will complete it. He continues in verse seven. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul says, don't mistake my absence from you. I would be there if I could, but I love you with the affection of Christ. He says, it's deep down in my heart. It is a deep-seated emotion that I have for you. It is not a fickle, sentimental love. It is a love born out of our common faith in Jesus Christ. And I hold you in my heart. I treasure you in my heart because God has knit us together in the cause of Christ. And he says, God is my witness. God, God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I remember in the Lucy and the Peanuts cartoons, uh, Lucy, <laughs> Lucy was complaining to Charlie Brown about people, just complaining. And Charlie says, Lucy, don't you know that you're supposed to love the whole world? And Lucy said, I do love the world. It's just people I can't stand. <laughs> and maybe you can relate, <laughs> depending on what day it is. But Paul, Paul, even though he was often mistreated and lied about and persecuted, he didn't let that jade him. He didn't let that infect him. He allowed the love of Jesus Christ to change him and then to give that love away to others. And he truly loved these people. And Jesus said in first, and John, uh, John said in first John chapter three, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life. How do we know that we're really Christians? Because we love the brothers in Christ. We love the family of God. Don't, don't tell me you're a Christian by how you sing and the style of music you like. Don't tell me you're a Christian by how much money you put in the offering plate. Don't tell me you're a Christian by what denomination you're a member of. Don't tell me you're a Christian by looking at all those things. Show me you're a Christian by how you love other Christians. And Paul says, I love you. And you have made it easy for me to love you. I've not always made it easy for you to love me, but I have felt your love and I have been changed by that. So thank you. Thank you for that. So not only am I uh, thanking God for past grace like Paul, there's a second thing I want to do today, and that is I am trusting God for future grace. I'm thanking God for past grace, but I'm trusting God for future grace. We see that in verses 9 through 11. Paul writes in verse 9, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more 
with knowledge and all discernment. Paul says, while we're talking about love, how I love you, let me also say my prayer for you is for God's future grace to help you abound more and more in love. You do love God and you do love the brothers and sisters in Christ and you do love me, Paul is saying. He says, but there's always room for more love, amen? Always room for more love. You, you've never heard anybody say, I've had just about enough of love. Can't take another bit of love. I, you know, you, you've, you've never met a mother who said, you know, I love my kids and won't ever love them anymore. I'm done. I loved them and I'm done. No, you, you have an ongoing love. You want your love to be abounding and to mature. And Paul is praying that for the, the Philippian Christians. And I'm praying that for you, that God's grace will continue to work in this congregation, that your love may abound more and more. Your love for Christ, your love for each other, your love for this world, the people of this world. Now, we're not talking just empty, sentimental love. He says, with knowledge and all discernment. Love is not blind. Love, if it's real love, opens its eyes. And love wants to be filled with the knowledge of God in his word and what he defines and love to be and how he describes love and what he says are the uh, outworkings of love. We need the knowledge of God's word to help our love be the kind of love that honors God. And we need discernment because not everything that we call love is love. Sometimes what we call love is just enablement. And we don't really love a person because if we loved them, we wouldn't enable them, we'd actually help them. We'd tell them the truth. And we would speak the truth in love. And so we, we, we need the knowledge of God's word and the discernment of the Holy Spirit to truly understand how Christ loves us and how we are to love one another. And Paul kind of mentions that in verse 10. He says, so that, here's why you need to abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment in your love. So that, in order that, you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Paul says, I'm not asking you to compromise your faith in the name of love. I'm asking you to stay true to your faith in the name of love so that you can approve. Just like gold is refined by fire, you can be approved, tested, verified what is excellent. Some things are not excellent. They're not the best for you. And the most loving thing a person can do is say, no, this is what love looks like and this is what love requires. This is the best for you. Don't settle for second best. You, you need that knowledge and discernment so that you can test and approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless in your own life, in your own attitude, in your own conduct for the day of Christ. Because Christ is coming back one day and you're going to stand before him, you're going to give an account of how you've lived your life, how you've loved God, loved others, served the world or not, and you're going to give an account that day. So don't you want the knowledge and discernment of God to inform your love so that you can approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless in your own personal life. So when you stand before Christ, look at verse 11, you'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul pictures them as trees filled with fruit, which is an Old Testament picture, Psalm 1. And the righteous person, according to Psalm 1, is like a tree planted by streams of living water which yield its fruit in its season. He says, I want God's fruit of righteousness to just be abounding in you as you learn more about Jesus and live for him. And it's all from Jesus. We can't do this on our own. We need Jesus if we're going to live this kind of life. Jesus is the one who said in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine... You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the source of our righteousness. He's the source of our fruitfulness. He's the source of love. He's the source of our partnership in the gospel. So this is why Paul is writing this letter. He goes on and writes several more chapters expressing his love and his gratitude to them. But I'm joining Paul today, Fort Carolina Baptist Church, as your pastor. I'm saying, I am thanking God for his past grace over these last 28 years. And I am trusting God 
for future grace to keep working in you to make you more like Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this this time to worship you. Thank you for this reminder that we have been saved by your grace. We've been brought together in the family of God and we have the privilege of being partners together in the gospel ministry in this church and through this church. Father, I thank you for your grace, not only in the past, but I'm trusting you for your grace in the future to be at work in the lives of each person in this place who knows you as their Lord and their Savior. So God, we, we trust you today that your Holy Spirit would take what we've heard and apply it to each of our lives. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes still closed, I wanna ask you a question as we make this practical. Would you be the kind of church member that the Apostle Paul could have written this letter to? Are you a partner? Or are you just a spectator? Is it about reaching more? Or are you just simply looking for a church that will serve you, but ask nothing of you? Are you willing to suffer and count it joy for the cause of Christ? Are you willing to love with discernment and wisdom? Are you willing to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that one day he's going to come back. Could Paul have written this letter about you and about me and about Fort Caroline Baptist Church? Let's recommit ourselves to Christ, saying, Jesus, maybe you'll pray silently in your heart right where you are. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me, but I want to recommit myself to be a partner with other believers at Fort Caroline Baptist Church for the days ahead. Thank you for your past grace, but we ask for a fresh outpouring of your grace as we continue to love Jesus and live for him. It's in his name we pray, amen. Amen.